Okay, we're we're live. Just letting you know. I'll <laughs> just show a few pictures that I took during that. Oh, you showed backward then. <laughs> I mean, it's, the, the stream the stream isn't backward though. Yeah, I'll, I'll take off the I'll remove this video so I'm not staring at myself through the presentation. I flipped that we have a nice on air. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sign now, that's nice. I so Jeff's not in the office, um, but he is online. You can hear, and you'll hear him talk. Do you have any pictures of posters in the show? I have, I have like, I took like 60 pictures. I was going over them and I said that. Okay. There's like one or two that really struck out. Hopefully you guys found the, uh, <clears throat> the papers and the link. Yeah, I think we're all set up. Um, I do have, I can show them if, as we, if we're going to go through them. Although this flicker is really nasty. Yeah, Jeff, There's nothing like this on it. camera? Yes. I mean, Jeff, you can see the, bo yeah. you can see the board, right? I can see the board. Most of I'm seeing your head, but I can see the board. I, I'll, I'll move the head soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, in this, I'm planning on doing just sort of an overview of capsules and just finding discussion points where I can relate it to parts of our model uh, and just seeing I, I see this as like an, a, as a jumping off point for seeing where it goes. And I'm still, I'm still doing a little bit of reading on capsules. I don't, uh, especially the third paper in, involving routing. Uh, and it goes through this whole complicated settling process that I want to understand really well. I, I don't, I'm not fully there yet on that, but I know it pretty well. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's sort of a, a, sort of a checkpoint meeting, sort of a pr conversation provoker, and we'll see what happens. Uh, but I mean, there's no big revel big new revelation here, but it's just, there's some nice parallels that I can draw and, and some nice interest nice things I can point out where there are subtle differences that are interesting. Um, so yeah, uh, the capsules, uh, there are these three papers that have been, that have come out or at least three papers from Hinton's group about them. One was in 2011, one was in 2017, then shortly after another one in 2018. Uh, and uh, so capsules are, I mean, I'll just go into like, what is a capsule briefly? It's a, it's a, it's a conceptually kind of simple thing um, that leaves a lot, um, a lot unconstrained. There's a lot of, every paper kind of does a new take on them. It does a subtle differences from the previous one. A capsule isn't a very constrained thing right now. Uh, so in these papers, a capsule generally has like, uh, eight to 16 cells. Um, and Hinton has specifically said that, that it may line up with the mini column. Uh, he thinks of it as possibly what a mini column is doing. Uh, and a, a typical layer of cells consists of something like 32 capsules. Uh, I mean, they change it up in different networks, but this is a pretty typical number. Similar with the eight to 16, sometimes it's 17, sometimes it, the point is, this is just giving you ballpark estimates of these numbers. Um, and so a capsule network, um, I'll, I'll just, in, in like 30 seconds, I'll jump and talk about like what is inside a capsule, but just briefly, um, a capsule network, the first level of it is quite a lot like our, um, our first few layers of our model involving input from the thalamus, um, resulting in essentially a location. Inputs to the thalamus, the layer four, activating something like a location. Uh, uh, because a location in our model is sort of like representing a, representing like a feature and what, representing what you're sensing and where it is. Um, and before I go a little deeper into that, I'll just say the remainder of it, like um, what happens after the first level of capsules to the second and to the third, um, is quite a lot like our child objects and parent objects being grouped together, like child objects being grouped together into parent objects. Um, 
and one interesting thing with this and with this model that is almost a little uncomfortable, and I think it might make Jeff Hinton uncomfortable, is the first layer is much different from the the remainders, of the, the remaining layers. The, the the first computation is much different from uh, from everything else. So the first one is um, taking an input and I don't know, doing something like spatial pooling, doing something. I, it's, it's very much the same how sometimes I've, I've pitched the idea that um, in our model, like layer the layer four, layer six network is um, learning these primitive features uh, and, and it's learning them really well, learning what they look like from every viewing angle. Um, and then the remainder of the network is, is arranging those, those features into compositions. Um, and councils are pretty much arranged like that uh, similarly. Uh, and which, which is just an interesting point because even some of Hinton's older papers tried to get away from that, uh, but, but with, with capsules, it kind of jumped back into it. Uh, so there's just a set of interesting discussion points to be had there. Uh, but, okay, a capsule, like what is happening inside one of these little squares? I, I, I drew four cells here, but it's more. It, it's sometimes eight, sometimes 16. Um, a capsule represents a feature and what he calls, what they call um, instantiation parameters. Uh, and that, that's a broad term that could just mean the location and orientation. It, it could be like, for example, I drew here a sensor and a pen cap, like the, like the, the cap of one of these. And, um, and it's representing there is a pen cap or marker cap and it's right there and it's at this orientation. It, the, the terminology they use in these papers for that, for location and orientation, is pose, which is way fewer syllables, so I like it. Uh, and, but a totally different type of, uh, a, a totally different set of instantiation parameters could be um, not, it's not about like changing the viewing angle or it's not about moving and rotating the object, it's actually about deforming the feature, deforming it into, uh, into something. Um, and in some of their networks, this is the kind of thing that pops out. Uh, it, it kind of changes on the, the setup of the experiment, the setup of the network. Uh, but in general, a capsule represents something that's parameterized. So it may be just its, its location, its pose. It may be like you can think of like old, um, old models like geons. You could imagine like having these cylinders that can be warped into arbitrary shapes like handles of coffee cups. And you can imagine instantiation parameters being where all that's kind of happening. Uh, so it's, it's, like, it's a flexible idea that, um, that, can, um, that can become different things based on, What's a based on how you, what you insert into it and how it's trained. Uh, so one thing about how these are trained, um, one of the discussion topics I kind of wanted to bring up because it, it shows where they went a slightly different direct direction than I think we would if we if we were building out this theory. Um, the first paper fed in um, the first time they they, they trained these capsules. Uh, they essentially fed in location information. Uh, they 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 passed in like essentially it's saying like at this sensor location or when the object is right here. Here's what you sense. When the object's right here, here's what you sense. Um, and it, it trains the network on that. Uh, and it kind of gave it that, that location information for free, that pose information for free. Um, and they justified it back then in that paper as, um, and, and, and by the way, I said, I said in here, I said that it incorporated movement into learning. Um, it didn't incorporate movement, movement into inference. It didn't ever, ever have a moving sensor that was moving around and inferring over time. But, but movement was inferred in the sense that they were passing in this kind of free location signal. Uh, and in what sense is that movement? Oh, uh, it's just a location feature. Well, just that's how they justified that. Um, that's how they justified giving it this free. Oh, input. that was their motivation for it. Yeah, the, the motivation was that like um, was that actual living beings do have movement information. They do have location information. They know that they move around. Um, so in the first one, they kind of unapologetically did that. Um, the later papers, they were proud of the fact that they'd gotten rid of that. They were proud of the fact that they, they were no longer um, they were no longer passing in that location information, 
which means they were no longer integrating movement in any in any way. Um, and when they when they made that change from passing in pose information, which is like you could think of this process movement information, um, it's like the capsules chain kind of moved from representing things like this to representing things like this. Uh, they kind of moved from rather than you know representing what happens as I move around, they represent more like warping features into different shapes, uh, which was just, I don't know, an interesting thing to point out. And, and in the subsequent papers, they were, they pointed out that like they, they'd solved a big problem by getting rid of this. But like, I think when, if, if, if we were to start doing experiments with capsules, I think we would be apt to try to bring this back into it, bring movement back into it, or some, some form of movement back into it. Yeah, I think maybe one way to characterize what you said also is, you, you, you know, in one case, you you must have movement to do your learning, um, and but they maybe they didn't really figure out how to do flash inference in that I don't know uh, in that first one, um, but in the second but in the second one for sure they figured out how to do flash inference yeah. and and they didn't they didn't require movement to learn the stuff you need to do for flash inference or we might say you, you have to use movement to learn the yeah. learn the structure but they did it purely in a flash setting. And it's interesting to note that, like, what six years had passed in between those the, the first and second paper. Like, it, I, I would like to know what 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 all dead ends did they run into in that time? Were they actively working on it in that time? Uh, yeah, I don't know if they were actively working on it or not. Actually, because there was so much else going on that he was involved in during yeah. that time frame. Um, and this is the whole time frame when Alex and Ed and a lot of other stuff really mm -hmm. happened. Between. 2005 and 2015, there's a ton of stuff coming out from those labs. Mm -hmm. So the other aspect of uh, interpreting these capsules is, in addition to a parameterizing pose, uh, the magnitude, the norm is considered the probability of existence for a particular object. Is that right? Yeah. So you're talking, you're talking in the second paper. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit when I get over to here. How they, how they used different ways of. Of, of using these cells. So yeah, you're, you, you talk about the norm. I'll talk about that in, I don't know, 10 minutes when we get to that. Uh, Marcus, is yeah. it, maybe, the, maybe the, the question that Jeremy asked, I was curious, is like you said, you have these eight to 16 cells, but they're encoding pose. And I'm saying, how do you encode pose in eight or 16 cells? Is that what you're gonna talk about in 10 minutes? I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to imagine what those columns are doing. Yeah, and, and honestly, I could, there's, no, there's no strict ordering of this. I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about this. Uh, this doesn't seem like if you try, you know, encoding pose, which is distance and rotation and so on, orientation. How do you do that in eight to sixteen cells? That seems really odd. Oh, very easy. Um, what is it? Huh? Going in six. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Rotation. Yeah, because these are real valued numbers. You only need, um, you know, three degrees of rotation, three degrees of translation, maybe scaling. You know, that's, oh. that's maybe eight degrees. You only need eight numbers to do that. Uh, and if you allow other variations, then that's you get a, a few. All right, so I, instead of calling them, I think of them as cells as real neurons, but really they're just variables, <laughs> real valued variables. Yeah, they talk about those vectors of variables. Maybe we should use the vector term. Like a capsule is essentially a vector. Yeah. I mean, I, all right, so so if Pim says maybe this is what mini columns are doing, I'm going to say no, that's not possible. Um, you know, because mini, the cells in the mini column aren't these real value uh, things like that. So, is, is that a correct assessment that, that that's not really that can't really be a mini column then? Yeah, it, it must be. The, there are. I mean, you can also bring up maybe it requires more than 18, 18 to sixteen cells. Maybe it requires like a hundred. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's more like a resolution. Well, it's more than that. You know, I'm thinking like because. The way that you know the whole concept of grid cells work is you know you have a complex mechanism that you need to represent location, and um, and it has to be based on movement. All these things are necessary, so it sounds like they didn't include that in this. They were just sort of taking like assuming we have this information, um, and just go from there. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think they're really solving. All the problems that we think grid cells are solving today, in terms of having all of these unique location spaces, um, you know, yeah. uh, 
you know, I don't I, listen, what, what fooled me, tricked me right up front is, you know, I expect out of Hinton, he's not a really, he doesn't really do these neural models, and they're not real accurate neural models. So when you say, hey, here's the, just these are mini columns, I slipped into my thinking about mini columns, and yet that's really incorrect at all. If I just said, okay, we're going to have a bunch of, you know, variables that represent these things, that's fine. Uh, the column, the column neurons in a mini column, it's, it just confused me. Um, so fine, I'll just stop thinking of them that way. And I don't know if you're going to get to that, but uh, didn't they do everything in a convolutional setup as well? Yeah, uh, um, yeah. And the um, and after the first paper, uh, the, the second and third papers, um, these capsules basically used a form of weight sharing. Uh, that they they did con there was convolutional capsules where like this cat this this one sort of symbolized is a single capsule. Uh, but it was applied over a limited part of the um, the image, the input, mm -hmm. um, and and they, and and then so this capsule is actually kind of replicated, what uh, however many times, twenty times or something like that, using the same filters, using weight sharing basically. Uh, so that they did bring convolution back into this in the second paper. Uh, so multiple levels of convolution. Yeah, so there are two convolutional layers and maybe. A yeah, so so the, the way that they do this at, um, in these papers is at the top they'll put a full they'll put a final array of capsules where there's essentially a, like you could think of them as grandmother capsules like like there's um, there there's one it's it's sort of like having one cell for each learned object except now it's one capsule per learned object um, and that's just what they do at the bot at the top of the network the rest of it is just kind of this. Um, Training process that learns whatever it learns and is kind of still magical. But yeah, at, at the top they definitely at the top they do um, a set of I called them grandmother capsules, but and and those are fully connected. So yeah, it's, it's kind of convolutional going up with the, both aspects of convolution, but that um, that the the receptive fields are getting bigger and there's weight sharing. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about this part. So um, one term that was new to me when I first jumped into capsule stuff was the word routing. Uh, it's and, very confusing, that word. <laughs> yeah, and, and now, it, it, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I can talk about, I'll talk about what it is and why they call it routing. So yeah, each level of these capsules is arranging parts into holes. Uh, so you can think of these like parts here might be like you know pen caps and a, a, a marker cap votes like oh there's a marker a, there's a marker like it, given the fact that I see a marker cap right here there is a marker right here um, and and the, you could come up with other examples where there's ambiguity though like I see there's a chair right here. Uh, so therefore, there's a um, therefore there's this conference room right here, or there's there's the, there's the other conference room. Um, it's a, it's a little weird when you talk about environments. So you could describe that in language like um, I see a chair here, therefore I'm in this room versus I see a chair here, I'm in that room. Um, but the point is, there's ambiguity here between um, I see a chair, and now I want to uh, use that to figure out where I am. Uh, there's ambiguity there, uh, and so the term routing comes from the way that the, the, the way they phrase this is not the way we would have phrased it, but it might be the best way. Who knows? Is um, this capsule has figured out that there's a chair right here. Uh, now it needs to decide where to send its output. It needs to decide: does it send its output to the conference? What, what room is this? This is neuron. This is neuron. This conference room is called neuron. Uh, do, do I send this? Is really confusing. Do I send my output to the neuron? <laughs> that, that, was, that was a mistake. Uh, so do I? Uh, so it's, it's deciding where to send this output. Do do I vote for the neuron room or do I vote for the dendrite room? Conference do I room vote for conference room A or for conference room B? Which is very um, confusing. So the way they describe this is the capsule figures out where to send its output, and they call that routing. And but that's that really is the process of narrowing down the parent objects. Yeah, I, I find that term very confusing because it's also it's not just this capsule on its own figuring it out because it's also the room figuring out which yeah which components best match given 
its view of all of the other components. Yeah. So it's like a you know it's like a voting process. That's yeah. Two ways. It's not really. Anyway, I don't know how they use that term. Yeah. So to do this, they have a set of these. You could call them cells that are gating these various connections. I drew just a couple example ones. Here's a cell. Here's a cell. Uh, and um, this process is called yes, it's called routing, uh, and it's a sort of a dynamic, recurrent, back and forth process of um, all right. I see a set of object parts, uh, and those are going to kind of vote on objects. Like I see eyes, they're going to vote on. There's a face. I see a pen cap. I'm going to, it's going to vote. There's a marker, a chair. You see a room, um, and with that, that's going to uh, activate a set of parent objects up here. Um, and to the extent that they agree down here, it's going to cause these cells to, uh, to activate or deactivate. These gates will basically um, let some inputs through and let other and, and sort of um, inhibit other inputs. Um, so, is, now, so is routing like object composition in our, in our theory? Yeah, uh, well, I would say the whole network is set up to do object composition. Um, routing is the part of inferring how these parts uh, fit into the whole, into the, into the comp compositional objects. Yeah. So yeah, it fits into the, the mechanism for op object composition. Uh, so, so, as, so these vote on the things up here, to the extent that they agree, these cells let the input through to the extent that they disagree, these cells inhibit the inputs. And then another round of voting occurs uh, and that it goes through this recurrent process of this iterative dynamic process of settling down on a set of parent objects. Um, isn't, that, and, isn't, that more, isn't that more similar to what we do between four and six A? I mean, is, is, is that the same as what we do in our, uh, you know, in the columns plus paper? It seems like it's doing the same thing. Because uh, I mean, there's not really movement here. There's, it's just the union. But it's almost like I have a union of possibilities. I'm set, and I'm somehow iteratively settling. Uh, you're right. I guess there's no movement. You're right. Yeah, it might be a little more analogous to our voting process. Yeah. Um, although it's not exactly that either. But it's. Yeah, I guess that's better. I think that's. You're right. That's probably a better analogy. I was seeing a relationship to attention. And other like attentional models, but a much simpler version of attention that is just using a single scalar uh, product between the outputs and inputs. It's deciding what's which from the model level is relevant based on some. This is the machine learning definition of attention. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that's not like the biology uh, attention. Yeah, that's. No, uh, yeah, I think the, the basic problem is it's a settling process. Uh, if you look at the, the chair analogy, the chair could belong to conference room A or B. You don't really know until you look at all of the other chairs and all of the other and, and see what both rooms have. So, um, you know, this, this, uh, this EM process or expectation maximization process is just like a clustering slash settling process that where each room tries to explain the various chairs based on yeah, it's model of what the room is. So how so how is it different than our voting, which is also a settling process? Well, uh, the, the, what this directly corresponds to in our model is um, is these cells right here that are um, that are kind of gating this um, play the same role as what we sometimes put in layer five, uh, the what the displacement cells basically. Um, as you recognize a compositional object, a narrowing process occurs in layer five of, uh, I see a chair, I remember all the places where I've seen that chair that activates a union of displacements. Um, now, uh, but I see other things in the room as well. And those, um, those kind of settle, they vote on, uh, they vote on I'm in this room. Um, so I guess the answer to your question is, um, our voting mechanism, the thing we have that happens in layer two, three, and in, in this, um, is is like is a form of this. What's different here is this is not voting just on object identity. It's also voting on the object's pose. It's voting on um, not only am I in this conference room, but I am right here in this conference room. 
so uh, how, do, how do they vote on that unless you've learned all of those poses? How, how if I'm in a unique pose and uh, relative to some object, how does any how are they going to know if I can't separate out the object from the pose? I mean, that what does it imply I have to learn every object at every pose? Uh, no, um, they, they learn these um, equivariant, what they call I think equivariant transformations or equivariant manifolds, or basically um, you, you can learn how things would move around in space. So if you were to look at just translation rotations that you would know how edges and stuff rotate and translate. And so given a new object, you would just find where it is on that manifold essentially. Uh, you don't have to relearn it for every single object. And in and, and, and our world, that's like... Um, that's like displacement yeah, cells. Yeah, it's like displacement yeah. cells. Yeah. You, learn, you learn the transformation between one reference frame and another. Uh, so then once you know where you are in one of those reference frames, you can figure out where you are in the other. Yeah. Uh, and you can that's something you can then you know vote on. Yeah. So the displacement would be like the simplest example of a of a transformation. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I'll talk about this. I'll, I'll point back in this, at this in a minute. Um, okay, so within the capsule, like Jeff asked about how can 16 cells represent a pose, uh, et cetera. Uh, so what's, what exactly is going on inside the, the capsule changed with, with each paper, uh, which is just to say that like, uh, this is very much an open area for research. I wrote here instantiation parameters representation and their in interaction. So what are the cells and how do they interact um, is an open research area. It changes with every paper. Uh, so um, in the initial one, the initial paper, it was like there's a cell that indicates, you know, is there is the feature present? Is there a coffee cup at all? Uh, and then there are nine cells that represent uh, what's the orientation of the cup. Um, and, and for this paper, they they fed in that orientation and they fed it in as, a, as nine numbers, uh, as you could call it cells, call it numbers. Uh, and that was basically how, how they made it work in that paper. Um, 2017, they did sort of a different extreme. They, um, they just give it 16 cells, which is enough cells to represent a four by four matrix but they didn't do anything to make it a matrix. They just gave it 16 cells. Uh, each, each one of these modules, sorry, modules, each of these capsules has 16 cells uh, and it's gonna learn to use them however it learns to use them. And um, the, the clever thing they did here to no longer have a, a separate special cell, they no longer have the present cell, they no longer have a cell that's just saying, is the coffee cup there or not? Um, and, and instead they have um, these 16 cells there, if you think of the cells as encoding a single vector, um, the direction of that vector is the parameters and the length of it is the probability. Uh, so it's, it's like, if there's absolutely a coffee cup there, then the activities of these cells uh, sums to one or the sum of the squares is one. Uh, and otherwise it's a shorter vector if, if, if the, if the, the object is less likely to be present. Uh, and in this one, you know, so what happened, like when this module talks to this module, you know, all 16 of these cells can connect, can connect arbitrarily to all 16 of these cells and the network learns whatever it learns. Uh, and in that they specifically showed what do the individual cells represent. And you got these nice, these interesting things where like, for example, on like the number three, like one of the cells would cause the three to warp in different ways. Uh, and it's just a cool way that it turned out to kind of parameterize the object to, to be able to, uh, you, you, could, you could change an individual cell and cause the object to change in some continuous way. Um, 2018, they then went and constrained it more uh, so that there are, they, they got away from the clever idea of using the vector length thing. Um, they found that that was making the routing not work as well as they wanted it to. Um, so 
they they went back to having a special cell that encodes the probability that the coffee cup's there, uh, and they still used you know these sixteen cells that are connected to each other, um, but they constrained it more in a way that um, makes it really. Uh, they constrained it in a way such that, well, if you consider what happens in matrix multiplication, if you consider, say, say you just, uh, say you have these four cells, say, say these four cells are right here, uh, and these input cells are this one over here. Uh, matrix multiplication in, of this cell involves taking these weights and taking these, uh, these specific cells uh, and multiplying the weights by the activity of those cells. Uh, the point of this is that this cell has no concern about these weights. The cell has no concern about these cells. It's, it's, it's very structured. Um, so they took this and I'm, I'm taking a long, I'm, I'm taking a long time to just simply say they put kind of a constraint in there to, um, to cause the network to perform matrix multiplication. Where where everything it can do is is going to be some form of matrix multiplication, but they still trained it to just let it learn whatever it wants to learn. They didn't they didn't feed in they didn't feed in matrices, but they made it where the connectivity of these is is essentially a matrix multiplication. Um, and it, it, like which is interesting because that 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 means there's like some weight sharing between these cells. That means like this cell and this cell are going to share the same set of weights, but to different inputs. Which sounds magical if you think in terms of cells, but to them they're thinking in terms of matrices. Well, it's convolution as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was a long way of saying this is a fluid area of how all of this is represented, and it's it's one of it's the type of thing that we would concern ourselves with, is bringing to the table things about like actual neural representations of location, actual neural representations of orientation, uh, and. And then, if you use those, if you use these biologically plausible uh, forms of these representations, um, how does that change, like the the, the network, the circuit, the the how the mechanism for for, for performing the transformations? Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're living in this world where they're just playing around with stuff, and we might be able to bring something to the table involving other representations of all, of these things. One sort of fundamental difference, I think. Um, if I remember correctly, um, when I read it, they, they can't really represent unions. They have to make a commitment as to what it is. And so this setting process, if there is any ambiguity between two objects, it's still going to pick the most likely one yeah. and settle it. And so the subsequent layers just have to live with that inference. Whereas I think we can we can do a better job maybe of representing ambiguity and uncertainty through unions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that in turn, our, like our column voting settling process is much, much faster as well, maybe because perhaps it, maybe we can represent unions and look at intersections of mm -hmm. unions and, and things like that. Um, so I think that's maybe one thing that the stuff we've worked on maybe has, is more powerful than this. Mm -hmm. The result of the um, reading is a probability distribution, right? So you can have multiple nodes in the output, such that a capsule and a tire. Yeah, but I think this voting process has to settle in on one. At the end of the day, one inference. The same design distribution anymore. It's just a single layer. I think so. I uh, that's what I remember. Maybe I'm mistaken. I, I think so. Um, I think, um, I think you're right. And, and it, I, th I think this is something that's going to change from implementation to implementation, because the most recent paper is doing the process EM, uh, the EM, EM algorithm fundamentally does what Subita is saying. It picks the most likely result. No, no, no. EM result. itself could could handle ambiguity. Uh, but I just think their implementation, if okay. I remember right. Um, so EM can represent a full distribution. Um, we can talk about that later. They're different layer by layer as well. The top, of course, needs to settle to one because it's doing classification. Yeah. But it could be the lower layer, layers are allowed to have uh, a distribution during, I don't know. Yeah, yeah my, re my recollection was it had to settle in on one map estimate. Yeah. Um, and then the subsequent layers have to live with whatever the previous mm -hmm. layers decided. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we may want it. That may be an interesting one to dig into. In, the, in that part, you're definitely you, you, you're definitely right that they they let this part settle and then they figure out this part. Then they figure out this part. They have no uh, back and forth. No back. Yeah, knowing what's going on up here doesn't. Uh, yeah.
yeah, knowing what's going on, on up here doesn't help the, the lower layers. So there is feedback in the settling process, but it's constrained. It's a local feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Layers, yeah. And it never goes up with yeah. the local mutation. Yeah, the, the feedback only goes down to like these cells. It doesn't go down to these cells because it goes yeah. to gating cells, basically. Um, OK, uh, last part. Uh, one interesting difference um, is that this is debatable. I have some green text in parentheses that, that gives like the, the, the um, alternate view. But in this, uh, in capsules, and this is also a way that Hinton changed over the years, it seems. Um, the location of the part relative to the whole location of the coffee cup handle relative to the cup um, is stored in the weights of this network, but there's never any, there are never cells that are representing that. Um, there are never cells representing uh, the location of the handle in the space of the cup, the location of the logo in the space of the cup. Um, these layers are representing, like, suppose this is cup and this is, sorry, suppose this is like, cylinder, handle, logo, and this is the cup. Um, this is just representing where the cylinder, the logo, the handle are, you know, relative to the viewer. It's the spatial relationship between the viewer and that, that object or that feature. Um, and this is the spatial relationship between the cup as a whole and the viewer. And there's nothing in between. There's no, there's no, there's no neural population representing um, where the handle is relative to the cup. It's, it's, repre it's represented, quote unquote, in weights. It's represented in the, the synapses. It's learned, but it's ne there are never cells representing that. Whereas we have our displacement cells, which are representing that. Uh, and that's just an interesting thing to note that, that early Hinton papers emphasized the importance of representing object-based features uh, and then learning objects as pools of those. Uh, but this is never representing those inactivity. It is, it is, it is inferring them, but it's only putting them in the weights. On the other hand, you can say that these cells that are performing the gating are sort of representing that. They're they're representing like, is this a handle of a you know of a coffee cup or is this a handle of a briefcase? Uh, and in that sense, they are they are kind of representing that by figuring out which of these is the right one, which of these arrows is the correct one. But it's a little different. It's more like it's more like turning something on and off rather than representing it in its fullness. So I guess, yeah, uh, the things I wanted to bring up was just um, we can map these to our models, to so various versions of our models. Um, one interesting thing was that it, it sort of has this bottom level that's much different from what the rest of the system is doing. Like who knows? Maybe maybe somehow you could somehow you could take this multiple level this multiple levels of capsules and make it more like more of a recurrent process. If you could sort of like roll this up into one network that then infers compositions of compositions uh, without without having to use this whole hierarchy, uh, there there might be some potential there. Um, the other thing. Yeah, I mean, really, the other the other point is like it's it's interesting to think about like these representations of location, pose, other things like you know deformations of the object. Yeah, that that would be where some of what we're studying kind of could fit into this. Hey, Marcus. Yeah, uh, I I have a very high level question. If anyone can answer this. So, you know, our whole work of my life has been sort of figuring out how it is the brain learns its sensory motor model. Like, you know, the movements are just incredibly important to how we learn and how we, and so the whole grid cell representations, for example, allow you to plan movements and execute movements. You know, so you have this model that's in, involved in mo motor behavior. And, and so that's how our theories are, are based. And I'm trying to understand where they're coming from for this. Are they trying to solve that same problem? Or they're truly really trying to do a better sort of flash inference, and they're trying to include locations to do a better flash inference. Or they do they recognize they need to go to this full sensory motor model, and this is a, on the path there. Where are they headed with this? I guess is maybe my question. I don't think that they're putting this big emphasis on movement. Um, they're more, yeah, they're not putting th that there, but they're they're trying to capture more of the. Um, 
realities of the world, the, re the, the, the structure of the world that like, um, the fact that, you know, objects are composed of parts and yeah, our yeah. networks. <laughs> so really, in the end, are they trying to do better uh, tasks on object classification of still images? Is that what this, that these networks are applied to? Uh, uh, y yes. Well, I would say it's more about um, describing what's in a scene. It's more about taking taking an image. With, they're starting with images right now and saying that okay, there is a um, there is this object right here, and there's that object right there, and they can actually describe the scene in terms of a set of capsules rather than having just some big. There's a cat, but rather something that yeah. describes the scene. Oh, yeah, that's, still, that's still, you could call that an extension of flash inference in some sense. Uh, yeah. um, I think they're starting there, but I think that like, I think they're going to continue to, I think they're going to bring this up to video and movement, uh, changing things, things changing over time. I, you know, I, 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 yeah, I mean, what was, was surprising was when I think you or maybe Supertime made a comment about how, you know, they've changed the way they think about these representations over time and it seemed like you're, you're moving getting away perhaps from the sort of the whole movement based idea um i'd say they moved a little bit closer to it when they when they made, made these like matrices uh, yeah so that that was a little closer but that yeah, was gone uh, in our world you know you know, were trying to get to some end goal and the end goal is very clear at least in my mind what it is and so the, the the steps we took along the way one of the steps was we said let's not focus on any kind of Flash inference. Let's focus on every, anything has to have movement in. So we started with sequence memory, and because that that's got movement in it, even though we're not moving, the the, uh, the world is moving, and and so we're just trying to get to that goal. And I'm, you know, I, I I'm trying to wonder the more the more we're trying to get to the same end goal we're trying to get to, then the more likely we can collaborate with them or learn from them. Um, and I'm just struggling with that, you know. Um, it, it just seems like, you know, movement through the world of our bodies and, and, you know, for example, how would this apply to somatosensory inference with fingers and hands and things like that? You know, do they talk about that at all? Or is it really sort of like I'm taking this image and I'm always taking an image and I'm just processing so, I mean, it? Yeah, what, one of the papers explicitly calls out that, like, uh, in reality, eyes are moving around the, all the time. And in this paper, we're not going to address that at all. Uh, so, yeah. They didn't, but I think that they're going to try to capture. They're going to try to do everything. Yeah. Well, well, you you can say that, but I thought people in the AI world would be doing this for the last thirty years, and they haven't. So this is maybe the closest we've gotten to someone sort of like sort of moving in the direction we're going in, and um, but I'm not so certain they will. I yeah. <laughs> so I think optimistic. I say yeah. Everyone wants to get to this full sensory motor inference modeling system. Um, but you know, it, it just, it's not clear because they may feel the same pressures that a lot of people feel. It's like, okay, I have to go do better performance on certain benchmarks and they may not be moving in that direction. I mean, ultimately everyone has to go in the same direction, but well, over the next 10 years, you know, what, where is this research group going to go? Um, yeah, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe one, one couple of things I can add. Uh, I think there's one fundamental intuition that's shared between our work and this work here, which is that uh, the way you define objects is at the, as the relative positions of component sub-objects or features or whatever. So that's uh, that you don't brute force learn every possible combination, but you try to explicitly represent the relative locations of things. And so by doing that, you build in representations that are invariant to changes in, in position and pose and so on. So I think that's a big thing that's shared. Uh, we do a lot of that relative move, uh, relative positions through movement. Uh, they're trying to learn it from, from static images. Uh, but then to your question of, you know, is, are they trying to improve recognition? They absolutely are. And that the way they're trying to do, by what they're saying is that by representing these relative poses and relative positions of things, uh, your end network is going to be much more robust to uh, changes. So if you rotate an endless image, for example, most and a lot of MNIST networks will break, but this one won't because it's going to be invariant to that. Um, you know, if you uh, make the images scale the images uh, to be larger and smaller, this one won't break because it's it knows how things change as you change scale. Um, you know, you don't have to explicitly train it on, uh, on every object, every image, you know, uh, at, at different scales. So their end network, their end goal is to make things a lot more invariant to these 
Um, yeah, and I guess we're doing that now too for like, especially the current work you're doing with Sparta and so on. But ultimately, you know, how the, the representation schema of the world is the most critical thing in all of this. And so now we're working on this model that's based on grid cells, which is really beautiful concept that nature has come up with. And, um, and, and that's integrated with that as movement. And so then, then all of a sudden it can explain how you can grab something with your hand, which is not like a picture at all and understand it. Um, and I, I guess, you know, I, I guess trying to decide how much time do I invest studying these and do I, do we go like, Hey, Jeff, let's go visit you and talk about our work. And, um, you know, will that, how receptive will they be to these ideas and how, how much will they understand our point of view? Um, uh, because I don't want to, you know, go down and just do better image recognition from a, I mean, you guys can do that from a machine learning point of view, but from a, a real theory point of view, yeah. um, yeah, I don't want to do yeah, that. I don't think they're going to pay any attention to what we're doing unless we have things working in real, with, with real data, with real scenarios. But um, that's, it's, funny, it's funny you say that because they took here with the capsule, they took a very theoretical approach, which initially uh, you know, one could argue did not move you directly closer That's to better object recognition. I mean, capsules are not winning any contests these days. So it seems to me that they they are taking more of a theoretical um, bottoms up. I mean, top no, no, they, do show, they do show improved results in a bunch of uh, scenarios on real data. Uh huh. The, 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 the stuff I was talking about is you know changes with respect to scale or orientation or affine transformations. So they're, they're, they are showing that now. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Are, are, are capsules being deployed? Um, no, you know? it's not deployed yet, but um, there are still scaling issues with, with this stuff. But they mm -hmm. are showing it working on real data and real, real scenarios. So. Well, what's your take on this? I mean, you know, so much that goes on from a neuroscience point of view. Again, I want to make sure I'm talking, everyone stands. I'm just talking about from the theory side of our work. From a neuroscience point of view, I have to decide is it worth really trying to, you know, collaborate or get involved with these people more or whatever. And um, I, I don't have a good sense for that. I don't know, you know, whether it'd be a waste of time or not. Um, and I, maybe that's the that's the bottom line I'm trying to figure out here is like, okay, if I if we go went up there and spent a couple of days with him and his team, whatever, would we come away frustrated or would we come away saying, oh, that was the best time I ever spent? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Yeah, I don't know. The Nobody knows. Yeah, I do know the machine learning world is very, very focused on having things actually work on real data. And anything else is just talk from their standpoint. That's their, because there's been a history of lots and lots of theories that have not gone anywhere um, in the in the deep learning world. And, and the stuff, often the stuff that works is very kind of simplistic in, in many ways, but it, it works. Um, so I think the community as a whole is very focused on does it work or not. Um, yeah, I know that. I, I know that. I just didn't know if these guys might be a little bit more um, open to other things. Yeah, You're saying no. Yeah, Hinton might be. I don't know. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the bigger thinkers. Are, might be. Yeah, some of the bigger thinkers might be. Um, I mean, the problem is we are. Our work has always been constrained by the neurobiology, and and almost none of these people really know the neurobiology at all. It yeah. doesn't know much neurobiology at all. And, um, and so, you know, we can sit there and, you know, it's not, in my mind, it's just not just another made up theory. You know, these are highly constrained theories that we propose and therefore we have high confidence that they're correct. Um, whereas if you just make up, you know, here's another way we might do something. Yeah. I can see why they come from that perspective. So, um, you know, I, my, my impression from my past interactions with Jeff, is that he really didn't care about the neuroscience and didn't know much about it, and that's that's his prerogative. Um, and so, my my from the past, I would have we, said we lost, for, like, we lost that, you for like four seconds there. Your, your interactions with him that have been what? Uh, where he was really not interested in the neurobiology. Uh, he did not. Um, he he didn't seem to express much knowledge about it, but also not much interest in it. And so. Until the capsule things came along, I just sort of said, yeah, okay, more deep learning stuff. Uh, it's not going to help us understand how the brain works. And now we've got this sort of intermediate representation here, which is getting closer to what we're doing. Um, and so I said, well, maybe things have changed. Maybe there is some common ground uh, and maybe we can learn from them. 
Uh, but I'm not so certain. <laughs> just, it's, it's, I hear enough stuff here that says, ah, maybe I don't really care about neuroscience at all. Um, and uh, maybe, and because of that, they may come up with with new representations which may not be fruitful for us or may not. Help. I, that's the bottom line. Is there really anything useful here? Uh, but, yeah, but, I think it really depends on the person. I think as a as a community, they are very hardcore. They want stuff. Their primary interest is things working in real real life. And you're saying that's and that's it really helps, and that's great. If it doesn't, uh, there's lots of other. Maps. That's 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 true, of course, for machine learning. I just was question: Is that still true for Jeff Hinton and his group? I don't know. Yeah. I guess it's just more open to this stuff, but I think I agree with you that it might be a little bit early in our progress. I think once we have some of uh, the new theory brought into the deep learning world, it might make more sense to go down and see some parallels of what they're doing. Yeah. At some point, they are going to have to work motor output into this somehow, and they might be interested in our solution. They might see parallels or. They might already be thinking along these lines, but I think, yeah, going in with some some framework that's working on real data. Uh, All right, I'm going to have to mute myself for a second here to take care of something else. You guys keep going. Yeah. Um, are you logging off or? Yeah, I couldn't tell. If he's, I don't know if he's listening right now. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't know if we should talk as if he hears us. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. well, we'll see. And when I was and when I was summarizing this, I, I left out one thing I meant to summarize. It kind of goes in with the question. I think one thing we've done that we would have done differently is they got away from uh, from feeding in locations to the bottom most layers, uh, whereas we would not have tried to get away from that. Uh, that they. Um, we would put more of an emphasis on incorporating movement into learning at all levels, whereas they have gone in this direction doing less of that. Um, so, yeah, part of when I summarized the various parts, I meant to say that. I meant to say that our research would bring movement into this world. Well, I'm back. I just, I had a, we have a little snafu going on here. So we have to take care of the thing. <laughs> but I'm back. Are you calling in from a coffee shop? No, I'm calling in from my uh, inn. But uh, but my, we think my wife locked the car key in the trunk with all of her art supplies. And so we don't have a car and she doesn't have any of the supplies she came here with. And so we're trying to get someone to open the car. Okay, well, that's it for my capsules discussion. And we can move on to supersize thing. Yeah. Uh, are you still able to stay on, Jeff? Yeah, 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 no problem. Okay, so I'm going to give a quick uh, recap of the, of the conference itself. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. You want to put correct? Uh, sure. uh, <laughs> okay, Subutai just presented at ICML, which is a machine learning conference. <laughs> Um, so he's going to give a recap of that experience as soon as we get him uh, hooked up. You can Google it. I got ICML 2019. They stated that yeah, good feedback, I think. Well, you'll find out. They didn't like it. No spoilers. When the probability is close to one, uh, what those dis those differences are tiny. Once you put it through like the nonlinearity, the uh, anyway, the point is this of this course. one does a much better job of giving more weight to a cell. Like if a cell has one, if one has if one capsule has ninety five percent confidence and another has like eighty percent or something like that, um, they can bring that into this writing process. But when they use the norm, it, it was a lot harder to. Is that true of this like 17th cell? How is it trained separately? How, how did they incorporate that? Everything else is just part of the vector. Mm -hmm. You're still logged in with the microphone? Yeah. Okay. 